Hi, everyone. Uh, it is Wednesday, January the 26th. Welcome back for our next installment of Ask Ashley with the eponymous Ashley Overhouse um, here for Legislation 101. Hi, Ashley. How are you doing? Hi, Eric. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm doing well. I'm happy to be here. Um, as, as everyone um, just heard, I'm the Resilient Rivers Director at Friends of the River. And thanks, Eric, for for leading us through here. You're our development associate. I'm very grateful for keeping me on track. It's uh, always more fun to make it a conversation instead of a lecture. So uh, yeah, as, as, as we've said, this is Legislation 101. It's January here in California, 2022. Yay. Um, a lot gets started in January, of course. Um, and, but it, and the, the, a lot gets set in motion that can be difficult to change. Um, and specifically with regards to the legislature and the state budget, both of those things obviously massively impact California in many different ways, but they're also like just really hard to grasp for the average citizen. Can you kind of start us off right there? Sure, absolutely. So as you said, this is the start of a new legislative season. It's really important because January 1st is not just New Year's Day. It's also the day when new statutes take effect and a new season begins for new lawmaking. The reason why that's important is because the California State Legislature is probably one of the uh, highest paid and best staffed legislatures in the nation. It's bicameral. What that means is there are two houses of representatives, the State Assembly and the State Senate, and um, both houses are professional, which means that they are expected to work full time and they have paid staff. Um, and the legislative season itself is a little bit longer, and we'll go over kind of a timeline later, but um, it does mean that for Friends of the River and for other people in the public that are interested in engaging, you have a greater amount of time to make a difference and to really connect with the people you've elected um, to be a voice for rivers, which I think is really important. Um, Friends of the River attracts and engages in um, the legislative season, and we'll do so again here in 2022 to make sure that we have a voice in the process. And so I guess maybe the question for some of our members even is, is why, why is Friends of the River involved in the state policy? Why is it involved in that universe to begin with? That's a great question. Um, I think that Friends of the River is really engaged in the legislative process to begin with because laws can either help or hurt rivers essentially. We really only want to um, promote or move forward new law that helps improve river and watershed conditions, especially in the face of climate change, um, and recover abundant and diverse populations and thriving ecosystems, especially key fisheries of concern that have recently declined. Those are indicators of overall river health. And we really want to make sure that proposed bills help do both of those things. And we also want to make sure that we're tracking any new law that is a threat to rivers. So funds irresponsible projects, um, undermines current environmental laws that are key protections for rivers, um, or really moves us backwards in overall water management. Um, you know, it's especially important in the face of climate crisis, which in Friends of the Rivers opinion, and in my opinion, is a water crisis truly for our state. Yeah, and we, we hear a lot about the climate crisis and climate change from our leaders, um, but what, what do we at Friends of the River feel like the government needs to be doing a little bit uh, more of uh, in terms of climate change? That's a good question. Um, California uh, really needs to be doing quite a bit more, um, but there's a really great opportunity, especially this year in new law. Um, California does not have a holistic climate-driven water management program. Um, so we essentially basically need to do what in the state, what we did for clean energy. Um, we need to make sure that all of our water management um, problems are addressed in one holistic program. And they need to have quantifiable goals and deadlines for protecting and restoring aquatic ecosystems, accelerating progress with um, groundwater management, reducing over-reliance, frankly, on our rivers and ecosystems um, and aquifers by investing in urban and agricultural conservation and efficiency, which we have done, we just need to take it a, a step further and really invest in alternative water supplies and multi-benefit natural infrastructure or green infrastructure. Those are all really important things that need to be housed under one holistic climate-driven program. So with the, the, the legislation process having started in January of 2022, it's uh, there's a lot 
we're not expecting everyone to uh, be able to process everything on the screen right now, but there's a few key deadlines that come really early in the year. Um, but what, what does that look like? Yeah, that, that's true. Um, I, I, this actually caught me by surprise as I was learning to be an advocate for the first time, how quickly some of these deadlines that are so important for the rest of this really long legislative season come so quickly. So many of the bills in California's legislative process become what we call two-year bills. And so if you've advocated for a particular bill in the past and it gets um, basically put on hold, um, really comes up really quick again, right after the holidays. So you have about a month um, to make sure that that two-year bill gets passed um, out of both houses. And so we have that first deadline coming up at the end of this month. And then shortly thereafter, we have one of the most critical time periods for the season, which is the committee hearings. So we have a couple of those deadlines here um, on the screen for people if you're interested. And we'll, we'll go into a little bit more of why that's important later. But then the other major deadlines are just indicators of when you really frankly need to have a bill heard before policy and financial committees. And then I, the identical version of the bill has to be passed by both houses and then signed by the governor to become law. Um, and so basically, you know, you really need to make sure that you are in the process or the meat making the sausage, so to speak, of when that bill is being formed um, in committees um, before it gets to the floor. Um, so basically FOR tracks important committees um, and those meetings will be basically through February and March. So that's coming up pretty quick. Um, and those committee meetings include the Assembly Committee on Natural Resources, the Assembly Committee on Water, Parks and Wildlife, which yes, is a whole different committee, um, Assembly Committee on Appropriations, which is funding or the financial impacts of a bill, um, the Senate Committee on Natural Resources and Water, and then the Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, and I know that sounds like a lot, it is, um, but thankfully, FOR is not tracking and engaging on this alone. Yeah, it, it is. It is so much. So um, what exactly, who do we work with? How, how do we make sure that this all gets monitored so it all just doesn't happen behind backroom doors? Yeah, it's, it's really important. Um, well, we're grateful to be a member of state and federal coalitions, or as FOR really affectionately likes to call force multipliers. Um, just because we're a small team doesn't mean that we don't have a really great um, group of environmental stakeholders and constituents across the state of California. We're very lucky. And so we're a member of especially a state coalition called Green California. And that was formed and facilitated now by California Environmental Voters Education Fund. They used to be referred to as the Conservation League of Voters, um, for those that are not familiar with that new name. Um, Green California is a network of more than 100 organizations of environmental health and justice oriented um, organizations. And they work collaboratively to speak to the legislature with one unified voice um, on a number of bills. Um, and so we attend Green California's Advocacy Day. You can see here on the slide, this is a screenshot of one of the virtual meetings that I attended as a representative of FOR in Green California last year in 2021. We were still in pandemic times, so their advocacy day near the end of the legislative season. So in this case, August of 2021, um, I think or actually early September, um, took place virtually. Um, it's with Assembly Member Carrillo here um, of Los Angeles. And we're really, really grateful to have that kind of um, access to representatives even during um, a pandemic. So we were able to advocate for a couple of key bills that we were hoping would get passed before the end of the season last year. And we look forward to doing that again this year. Um, we're also members of subcommittees through Green California to track certain issues to make it a little easier. So we're one of a number of organizations as part of the water subcommittee. And that way we're able to focus in specifically on bills that impact rivers. It's uh, it's not just Green Coalition that we're the Green uh, Green California that we are a coalition of. Um, what else have we got? We also are members of the Hydropower Reform Coalition. Um, so that's a national coalition that it's broken down by regional caucuses. So the HRC or Hydropower Reform Coalition protects, enhances, and restores America's rivers, watersheds, and communities affected by hydropower operations. And as we've talked about here before on Ask Ashley, hydropower is um, part of a 
you know, dams, basically hydropower dams, really you generate hydropower based on um, a number of impoundments or dams and canals. Um, and the HRC is a national coalition that really tracks those kinds of issues that impacts rivers um, from a national lens. And then the California caucus is able to really focus in on state policy issues. Um, the coalition's combined membership represents more than 1.5 million people across the country. And we have over a dozen organizations alone that represent millions in California. So it's a really powerful coalition as well. And we're grateful to be a part of their um, coalition and a member of their national steering committee. Additionally, I think as we've mentioned on Ask Ashley here before as well, I'm the California chair of the caucus. So I'm able to really help provide that policy lens for Friends of the River and track and engage on these issues specifically. And so uh, we've obviously we've mentioned the word tracking quite a bit now. How does one actually, how does anyone track all of this since it's happening in the middle of a pandemic in Sacramento? How does someone in LA do any of this? That's a great question. Well, we're really lucky here in California to have a lot of online resources that are available that makes, frankly, virtual advocacy much easier. Um, one of my favorite websites that we have um, screenshot here on the slide is called ledgeinfo.gov. And it is the best way for myself, as well as any lay person to track individual bills. So where the orange arrow is, you need to put in the associated bill number um, and make sure that you also have, um, you know, ideally the right year. So when you press go, you sometimes have to then narrow your search to make sure that you are in this year and you're getting the right bill, um, that you're the right piece of legislation that you want to comment on. Once that page does come up, you have all sorts of information at your fingertips. You have the author, you have the status of the bill, you have a list of uh, who's in favor and who opposes. It's really helpful. And then you also show what committees it's been before and when those committee hearings are. Um, and then, of course, FOR also tracks legislation using, um, thankfully, the resources of the coalitions that we just mentioned um, internally. So we do have quite a bit of um, support with tracking legislation across both coalitions. And obviously, tracking is, is only the first step of it. Like we, we have ideas about how the, the laws should, should shake out. So what does that uh, that commenting actually look like? Are we or do do you testify in front of committees? Are you talking to specific legislate legislators? There was that previous advocacy day in front of uh, assembly. Was that Assemblyman Carrillo? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, so that's a great question. So absolutely, tracking is just the first step. Um, when required, FOR needs to take steps to then engage to influence the actual bill itself. And of course, there are limitations um, because we are a 501c3 on what we can we can do with directly lobbying or advocating for certain bills. So we do choose wisely um, when to engage. Um, when we do, um, we do three different things. We give testimony before committees. Um, so during the, the virtual um, world, it was um, a phone system actually sometimes or Zoom or another web platform. Um, they didn't need to see your face, but they did need to be able to hear your voice. Sometimes it was as simple as a, a yay or nay for, a, you know, opposing or supporting a bill. Other times it's as complicated as expert testimony or technical analysis. Um, and that is really given in, in hearings. Um, and that is hopefully going to remain a virtual or a call in option again this year. Um, the second thing that we do is we also sign on to other organizations letters with policy analysis that's really detailed and we basically support and leverage other organizations work and they submit those letters then to either an author of a bill or submit it directly to the legislature as supporting um, or opposing a particular bill. And then finally, third, like you mentioned, we actually talk to just legislators, especially authors of particular bills of concern. Um, that impact our uh, coalitions um, and the issues that they advocate for. And oftentimes it is, um, it's really wonderful now doing it virtually with either the staff of the representative or the representative themselves. And um, we're really grateful that we've done days like California Rivers Day in May or the Green California Advocacy Day, where we get to have those conversations that are so important with our elected officials. And, um... Obviously, legislation is only one half of it. There's also the, the budget, 
we all know, I'm sure many of us have heard that California is, I think we're the fifth largest economy in the world right now. So there's very large sums of money moving around. Um, Governor Newsom just released a draft proposed budget, I think two weeks ago. Um, how, how does the, the budget tracking process, what does that look like? How does it differ from the legislation process? Yes, that's a really important piece here as well. So while we have individual bills um, that we track and engage on, there is an overarching funding mechanism that is also a technically a separate bill itself that we have to track and engage in as well. And that's called the state budget. And the state budget has its own deadlines, as you can see here in this great flow chart by the ACLU. Um, and uh, the first draft uh, was released on time um, a couple of weeks ago by Governor Newsom and his administration. And to give credit where credit is due, we were excited to see that Governor Newsom um, released a budget that is not only marketed better for the public to understand called California's Blueprint, but it also prioritizes climate change. There were five big priorities in the budget, COVID-19 response, climate change is number two, homelessness, inequality in the state's real public safety plan. And we really, that was something that was exciting for environmental stakeholders and, and FOR to see. Unfortunately though, um, really the budget did not mention healthy rivers um, in, in very many areas. So one of the things that we do is we're going to be engaging or tracking the budget as it's moving forward this year, just like we would any other bill. Um, so it's looking like we should really need to engage during the same time period that we do with the other bills when committee hearings, budget subcommittee hearings will be happening over the next couple months. And those will be important for FOR to, to track and engage in. So how does uh, members or organizations from the public um, track how do we track the budget process? How can we influence that? Is it roughly the, is the same or, or different from this legislation process? Unfortunately, it is um, a, a bit more um, convoluted than the actual bill process, as complicated and complex as the bill process was we just described. Budget process is even harder to engage in, frankly, from a public perspective. You have both two websites um, and technically a third if you really want to get into it, um, of where you can find different documents related to the budget. And here we talked about the Legislative Analyst's Office is the number one I suggest, and then the California Department of Finance. And those have great summaries, especially executive summaries of the governor's budget. Um, budgets are a statement of values, and this proposal does fall short. Um, during the stakeholder briefing for em environmental organizations, the Natural Resources Agency Secretary Wade Crowfoot acknowledged that California water management is always a work in progress. Um, but as he's related to what's contained here in the budget, we're hoping that that work in progress is, is really fast paced and happens during this budget season. Um, because there really is no good way for the public to engage in the budget and the public um, process for um, really understanding the budget is convoluted and difficult as well. Um, so we're hoping that through Green California, um, we can engage in the budget in this limited time window and see how, what we can influence um, through the legislature as they come up with their own version of the budget before the May revise is published. And that's all, um, it, it, that also has to happen before July because our, our California's fiscal year is, is July to June, I believe. Correct. Correct. Yeah. On that previous slide, you saw, I think, um, that the budget actually has to be passed by June 15th. Um, and so, you know, that's that's something that it comes before you know it. it it's, it's actually pretty quick, um, that process. And there's quite a bit of negotiation here between the legislature and the Newsom administration on where they want to spend money and how. Um, and, you know, this year we were excited to see the Newsom administration right off the bat propose an additional 750 million to tackle the drought on top of the 5.2 billion he proposed in his budget last year. Unfortunately, the line items of how that 750 million is being spent, we don't feel is really driven um, by the climate crisis. It's not equitable and it's not actually really solving long-term the impacts that we have and the lack of resiliency in our water management system. And also is not prioritizing most importantly, healthy rivers that are critical um, to resilience. So Friends of the River is going to urge um, our leaders um, to take action and review our recommendations moving forward here in the next couple of months. 
And, and the last uh, part of all of this is, is the, the management plans and um, adaptation strategies, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, sort of how the executive branch is meant to implement all of these laws and, and budgets that are flying around. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes, exactly. And the reason why we, we put it in this kind of graphic is because there really is no good way to connect all of them, but we wanted to make sure that our, fr our friends of the river um, really understand why we are engaging in certain management plans. So this is certainly not all inclusive. These are just the three that Friends of the River is tracking um, that we feel are really important, especially in 2022. So the first is the water resilience portfolio. Friends of the River and a number of other organizations submitted recommendations on this portfolio um, during a stakeholder intensive process throughout 2019. And we were actually really pleased to see the Newsom administration include a number of recommendations in the final version published in 2020. Unfortunately, that version also included another um, a number of other problematic projects, including surface water storage dams and canals um, and diversions that were really just unsustainable and would hurt rivers. So we were looking forward to hearing more progress on this plan um, in 2021. We got a 2021 update or a progress report published this month. Um, so breaking news alongside the draft budget, um, the Newsom administration also published a progress report. And we were not um, requested to submit stakeholder input on that progress report. So really Friends of the River is reacting in real time here. And we're going to be looking forward to seeing more from the Newsom administration on what their plans are for implementing the rest of the portfolio in, in this term. Um, the second management plan really is um, the uh, climate strategy, um, which is really, frankly, taking um, what's implemented in the water resilience portfolio or mentioned and putting it into the framework statewide with all the other resource management issues. Um, and they are required by the um, legislation to update this climate adaptation strategy every five years. So this was a critical opportunity for Friends of the River to review that climate strategy and request that healthy rivers be incorporated as part of an overall holistic climate driven plan. Um, so we submitted comments alongside a number of organizations in November 2021. And that final plan has actually not been published as of yet today, January 26, but we look forward to when it is because it will outline the state's key climate resilience priorities and measurable steps. And one of the key flaws, of course, that we pointed out was that there really is no enforcement um, or enforceable metrics in the main document it relies on, which is the water resilience portfolio. So that's how those two are connected and why Friends of the River cares and comments on both. Um, and then finally, the last one is an exciting opportunity and connected to the budget, and that's the 30 by 30 initiative. So in October of 2020, Governor Newsom signed a executive order that basically committed our state to the goal of conserving 30% of our lands and coastal waters by 2030. And uh, I remember this is kind of where we, we kind of want to jump in and kind of alter the conversation because I remember I was sitting in on one of those stakeholder calls and um, the secretary mentioned conserving lands and coastal waters and there was almost no mention of the water that's inland, um, which obviously we're at Friends of the River, we are, more, we are concerned about. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly correct. Um, I think that there, some part of this great initiative, the, the message has been lost, rivers have been forgotten. Um, they are the veins truly of the California landscape. And when you're talking about conserving large swaths of land, you are ultimately also conserving the, the waters that run in them, um, which can take the form of rivers, streams, creek beds. Um, and really that's important for them to really directly acknowledge in this draft document. Um, they, they released a draft strategy document called Pathways to 3030, and it's out right now for public review. And so Friends of the River, um, encourages everyone truly to review this document and comment. It's a really easy comment form to fill out. It doesn't take very long. Um, and the deadline is February 15th. So you have some time. Um, this is an important initiative. And most importantly, it has a chunk of funding um, under the, the state budget for this year to, to really implement this thesis pathways document. 
So once it's finalized, it has the money to move forward and help our state achieve that resilience that it so desperately needs to the climate crisis. Uh, we just want to make sure that rivers are a key part of it. Um, so obviously this has been a, a massive amount of information we have we have unloaded on people. It's hard even for people whose job it is to keep track of all of this. What can um, our, our, our volunteers and members do? What can members of the public do to, uh, to chip in for the, all of this? Yes, please. Um, I think that that's really where we are going to need help. Um, so quickly, there's, this is a more resources page. Um, so this is a lot of information. And if you want more detail, you want to understand more about this policy process, we listed here just a couple resources and organizations that we rely on, frankly, um, for additional help. And then there's an additional free lecture from a community college um, that we listed there for just a legislate California Legislature 101 civic sort of course um, that we also highly recommend. It's not very long um, and it's linked there and we'll be posting that later once this video is live. Um, but I think that we frankly encourage people to take three main actions. Um, first, please, if you can support Friends of the River and consider donating today. We are a small team and this is a lot of work. It's just one segment of the work that we do. Um, and so we're really grateful for any kind of contribution that you can give. And second, please, as we just mentioned, submit a comment on that 30 by 30 draft path, pathways document. Um, it's a really important initiative by the Newsom administration and by our state. It will really help with climate resilience and we wanna make sure that rivers are, have a voice in that document. Uh, you can comment before anytime before February 15th. And then finally, third, please sign up for our newsletter, letter, the, the River Advocate, um, and to receive email alerts from us and volunteer with Friends of the River to learn how to be an effective advocate for rivers. That's the best way that we can make sure that um, we have all the voices in the room when decisions are being made by our state leaders. Um, you can help us be a voice for California rivers in every forum. And as they say, it takes a village. So uh, all of those links are, are here on this page or they'll be in the in the description of our Facebook or YouTube video. Our website is friendsoftheriver.org. You can follow us on social media at these uh, handles here. I won't read them out. Uh, they'll all be visible. Um, and again, if you can support us, that's great. We really appreciate it. Uh, we, we need all the help we can get to really make sure that rivers are valued and 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 uh, there's a focus on rivers um, in all of this legislative process. Um, thanks for joining us today. Again, I'm Eric Robbins with Ashley. Uh, any any closing thoughts, Ashley? Um, just thank you again for tuning in to Ask Ashley. It'll be a monthly video, and we really appreciate your support of Friends of the River and um, really uh, thank you again for taking the time to learn about our legislative work. Thanks, folks. Uh, if you've got any questions or uh, want to know about more things in the future, just put it in the comments and we'll, we'll get back to you. Thanks for coming today and uh, we'll see you on the other side. Thanks, everyone.